Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Patrick Olson and I'm a product sales manager here at Hawkridge Systems. Today we're going to take a look at how to build stronger parts faster on Mark Forge composite printers. Uh, we'll take a look at the Mark II which is behind me which is in the desktop series, the X7 from the industrial series and of course we're going to talk about the FX20 because we're super excited about that and hopefully you are as well. Uh, during our discussion today we're going to take a look at the software which is specifically designed for these printers and what brings your functional parts uh, to light. So you, you import in a file and you come out with a functional part. We'll talk about materials that we use in the composite printers, and then we'll also take a look at some parts and applications along the way. So you're probably familiar with Mark Forge. One of the reasons why you're here, you're probably looking to get some more information on their printers, but you might not be as familiar with Hawkridge Systems. So Hawkridge Systems just celebrated our 25th anniversary as a value-added solutions provider. And what I mean by solutions provider is we offer a lot of products that tie together and work together as a complete package. So starting off on the software side is we have uh, SolidWorks and CamWorks, just to name a couple. Those are your first steps when you're, when you're building out a product and you're working on a design. Moving on from that is we have a 3D uh, scanners from Artec and Creaform. And those things are great for if you're reverse engineering something or you're working on complex geometries and you want to build a part that mates up. So there's no simpler way to do that. Uh, 3D printers from Mark Forge and HP, and then tying it all together with post-processing from AMT and post-process tech for those vapor smooth, like perfect finish, like it's injection molded. So we're going to talk about uh, a few things today, but if you have any questions, please put those in the chat. We'll address those at the end, but hopefully we'll answer a lot of your questions as we're moving along today. So with that, I want to introduce you to Kanan Irons, one of our application engineers here at Hawkridge Systems. He's going to walk us through these printers and you know lead us through the discussion today. So Kanan, why don't you introduce yourself and get us started. Thanks, Patrick. Hi, I'm Kanan Irons. I'm a 3D printing application engineer here at Hawkridge Systems. I'm based out of our San Jose Digital Manufacturing Lab located in Northern California. And if you're not too familiar with Mark IV's 3D printers, these systems have a reputation for being extremely reliable. They produce incredibly strong parts, and these parts also have excellent surface finishes. And Mark IV also develops their own materials and their own software solutions. And so with them, you get the complete package that makes it nice to use, easy to learn, and easy to install. The systems behind me operate off of two different printing technologies. The first is called fused filament fabrication, and that's a form of material extrusion that starts with filaments that are fed through a print head nozzle as your parts are built up layer by layer. And the second technology is called continuous fiber reinforcement, or CFR. And it's through CFR that we're able to achieve metal-like strength in our 3D printed parts. And that involves embedding fibers into your plastic part at strategic layers to maximize mechanical performance and you can even tune the part for your specific application using those fibers. And so let's go ahead and take a look at the systems. We have the Mark II and the X7 here. We're going to go ahead and start off by overviewing the Mark II first. And so Mark II has a build volume of 320 by 132 by 154 millimeters. Fits nicely on your desk. And it has layer heights from 100 microns all the way up to 200 microns. And now most parts that we print on these systems are around 100 microns, and that gives you a, a great combination of surface finish and also great print times. And then when we come to power requirements, both the Mark II and the X7 plug into a 110 outlet, so they're easy to install, easy to move around, and they operate off the Iger slicing software, which has been developed by MarkForge. And that's mainly a cloud-based software, but there's also offline versions available for those customers with high security requirements. When we move on to the materials, there's plastics and fibers available. So the plastics, we're looking at onyx. That's going to be the most common plastic that you, know, you may have seen before from Mark Forged. And that's a nylon chopped carbon fiber mix. And onyx by itself is a very strong filament. It's stronger than many on the market already. There's also a white nylon, which is a little bit smoother. It's a little bit more flexible. It's great for any work holding applications that you need to be non-marring. And it has that higher elongation to break. When we go to fibers available, we have carbon fiber. That's going to be the strongest fiber material offered by Mark Forge. Parts that are reinforced with carbon fiber have metal-like strength. And we're talking 
meeting or exceeding 6061 aluminum in many cases. And so that, that's an exciting material because now we could replace those machine components with parts directly off the machine, off the 3D printer. And then we have Kevlar. You think about Kevlar in other industries, you think about bulletproof vests, you think about those applications that need to be very impact resistant. Uh, Kevlar is great for sudden loading conditions, and so that's the same case with the MarkForge Kevlar. Then we have your HST, HT fiberglass, with it, which is a high strength, high temperature fiberglass. This material has the highest heat deflection temperature of any of the Mark Forge fibers. And then we have fiberglass finally, and that's going to be the most affordable way to still achieve great strength benefits with your parts. And with that, let's go ahead and open up the printer here. And so we're going to look at the Mark II, open it up, and notice that we're printing a part right now. The operation of these machines is very quiet. They're office friendly. There's no ventilation concerns. There's no outgassing concerns with your parts. And so it, it makes it nice to use from a facility perspective. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Kane. And all these uh, printers, even in the industrial series, the X7 that we're gonna take a look at here in a little bit, they're office friendly. So that's very important if you're working on, uh, on a project, doing some R&D work, or just trying to redesign something and you don't wanna have to keep running down to the shop floor. It can be sitting in the corner of your office and isn't any noisier than a, you know, just a copy machine that's in your office. So what about uh, you know, build chambers and the heated chambers? These are not heated, but there are a lot of, and there, there's differences between them. So can you explain what this is as far as uh, the chamber on there? Yeah, so the X7 and the Mark II have an unheated chamber, and there's a few key advantages to that. Uh, one of them is it gives you more access to the print bed before, during, and, and after prints. And for example, let's go ahead and pause this print here. And on the Mark II and X7, we can do this. We could pause the print. And let's say we wanted to drop in some hardware mid-print. We can actually remove this bed. It's connected magnetically. And let's say I wanted to drop in an electronic component. It could be a magnet. It could be a threaded component. You could do that mid-print and then place it back in the machine and continue to print over the top and it will embed those components in your parts. So you can't do that without a, uh, with a heated chamber. So the other advantage is that you have more access post-processing. So when it's time to scrape these parts off of the print bed, we have more access to all sides of the build platform. And so that just makes it a little bit easier and easier to work with when the time comes to post-process. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, by uh, being able to stop the print, uh, embed magnets or, you know, do inserts in there, um, even print out, you know, uh, holes for tapping later on, it just eliminates a whole other step after the part is produced. Um, so you can just get a, a functional part right off the printer. So carbon fiber is a, is a big topic. What, what's the strength of that versus just the regular onyx material? Yeah, so we see about an eight times strength improvement with a, an onyx part that's been fully reinforced with carbon fiber. And we're talking about flexual strength mainly, that's the bending force and, and resistance that we could add to these parts. And that's done through the use of these continuous fibers. So let's take a look at a sample part here. And so here's a, a spur gear that we've printed and we paused it mid print and we've reinforced this layer with Kevlar. And notice how we have fiber following the contours of each tooth on this spur gear. Those are called concentric fiber rings. Those are gonna strengthen our teeth. Then we also have rings around the internal holes. And so that's gonna reinforce those holes to side loads. And then we have these interior fibers called isotropic fibers. And these fibers have a direction to them. And with each layer, I could change the complete fiber layout. And I could even change the angle of the fibers because it's when the fibers are in tension that they're gonna be helping you in adding that metal-like strength that we talk about. And so with each layer, I could customize it and fully fill it with fiber if desired, or I could just put a little bit on the bottom, a little bit on the top, and create a sandwich panel that's still going to give you some great benefits. And so when we look on the printer itself, this is accomplished through the use of your two materials. You have your plastics, you have your fibers. Your plastics are stored in a dry box. On the Mark II, it's behind the machine. So that's going to be our Onyx, for instance. And then your fibers are actually going to be in this chamber here towards the left side. And both of those materials are fed into the machine with two different extruder motors. They're fed into the print heads. You have two nozzles. And so the, the printer will begin to lay out that plastic. And then when you get to one of those fiber layers, it will begin to iron in that fiber and embed it with each layer that you've identified beforehand. 
Yeah, it makes a super strong, uh, strong part for sure. What about uh, support structures in these, on um, both of these printers or in the composite line from Mark Forge? Yeah, so the support structure on w one of these systems is gonna be the same material that you're printing with on the plastic side. So that's gonna be your Onyx material. In this case, we're printing with Onyx. And I have an example here we'll take a look at. So here's underneath a, a housing. And I have a piece of support structure that I pulled out of this central area. And notice how it's an accordion-like structure. And so it has a direction to it. It could be removed by hand or through the use of pliers. Uh, for instance, on this part, we just pull it out just like that and it would remove. And you typically take about two minutes on a part like this is what you'd expect uh, as far as support removal goes. And that happens on any of your overhangs. Yeah, is there a way to eliminate the supports altogether? Yeah, there's actually some great design for additive manufacturing strategies or DFAM that yeah. we can apply. And, and one of them is that we add angles into the parts. So that could be a chamfer, it could be a teardrop shaped hole. And I got a sample of that that we can take a look at. So on the, if you look on the left side of your screen, you see these circular holes that require support structure. And that's because we have overhangs. But if we're able to move on to the other part here, Notice how we angled and teardrop shaped those holes. That allows us to eliminate supports. And what that does, it's going to speed up the prints in many cases. We're going to use less material, and it's going to cost less on the material side. So we'd use this type of strategy in all sorts of applications, and I use it whenever I can because it's going to save you that time on the back end. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good time saver. What about surface finish? Is it is it really high quality, or do we have to do post process on them at the end? Or so one of the strengths of Mark Forge equipment is that right off the printer you have an excellent surface finish, and that's why many folks like the Mark Forge system, especially for product design. Uh, let's take a look at this sample that was printed on the Mark II. Uh, so we have these textures here. That's straight off the printer, and as I open it up it's very difficult to see any layer lines with this. This is onyx material, has a matte black finish. And so we have several customers that will sell these parts to their customers right off the machine. And so that's definitely one of the advantages of the Mark II or the X7. Yeah, so that, that's a great overview of the Mark II and what the capabilities are in that. Let's talk a little bit about the X7 now. So can you walk us through this? Yeah, so let's start off with the build volume. So on the X7, we're looking at 330 millimeters by 270 by 200 as far as the build volume is concerned. And it has a, has a little bit larger footprint. There's a, a cabinet underneath the printing portion, and that's a two-piece. So you could separate those two. Let's say you need to move it around your facility. It's very easy to do. Uh, with the X7, we have more layer heights available. So we go from 50 microns all the way up to 250 microns on a turbo print mode. The 50 micron setting is great for smaller parts, maybe more delicate, but you need more resolution in the Z axis, more accuracy. And then on 250 microns, that's going to be twice as fast as anything that the Mark II can produce. And so if we're talking about large parts, maybe it's higher quantities of parts, that's great for your turbo print modes. And then one of the major advantages that we see with the X7 is the inclusion of a onboard laser micrometer. And that enables a few features. And one of the really neat features is called Blacksmith. And so that's an add-on software subscription based from Mark Forge. And what that is, is it allows you to do an in-process laser inspection. So now we're able to scan the parts as they're being printed. And it's going to generate a point cloud. The software is going to generate a report for you. And so as soon as your part comes off the machine, you know that your part was accurate. And you could trace that all the way back to the beginning. And so we're really excited about that feature. When we come to power requirements, we're still looking at 110 volts, plugs into the just a regular wall outlet. On materials, we have everything that we saw on the Mark II, but there's the addition of a, a few other key materials that we'll take a look at. One of them is called Onyx FR, which is a flame retardant version of Onyx. It's actually VO rated, and it's certified for flame, smoke, and toxicity, FST. And so we're seeing these types of parts being used heavily in aerospace. We're seeing them used quite a bit in automotive, those industries that require that type of certification, that VO rating. Then we also have Onyx ESD, and that material is an electrostatic dissipative material. And it's great for any time you're working with circuit boards, electronics, it protects those. And we could be talking about enclosures, maybe assembly jigs. And Onyx ESD also happens to be the strongest plastic material available for Markforged. 
And so it's even stronger than your standard Onyx. And so uh, for those of you that are already working with Onyx, we, we highly recommend trying out the Onyx ESD. And then we have Onyx FRA. And that's an aerospace version of the Onyx FR. And it has lot traceability. And that's a requirement for many aerospace companies, many automotive companies. And so now we're starting to see Mark Forge parts being used on, in cabin for aircraft. And so that's, that's really exciting. When we come to fibers available, there's also a carbon fiber FRA. And so it's still going to have that flame retardance and that aerospace lot traceability that we talked about before. And so that's the lineup of the materials. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the system. So one of the first things that is always good to see is how do the build volumes compare to each other? So Patrick, if you could open up uh. the X7, I'm going to open up the Mark II. Okay. And we're going to compare the build beds to each other. And so right off the bat, you see it's about twice as big on the X7. And the obvious advantage is you could print larger parts, but you could also print more parts at one time. We'll often fill these build platforms up with parts, let's say 20 or 30 parts, and we'll print those over the weekend, maybe overnight, and then we come in and we have way more parts on the X7 than we could with the Mark II. The other advantage that we want to point out is the onboard laser micrometer. And so that's actually located on the print head here. And there's a few more advantages to having this laser micrometer. One of them is that it's going to scan the print bed before every print so that you know everything's level, everything's properly adjusted. It will also scan an extrusion of material to make sure that you're extruding properly. And it has the ability to adapt to any imperfections in, in the bed itself. So that's called adaptive bed leveling because those early layers are just so important when we look at printing apart. The other features, we're looking at material. Uh, you still have your fibers that are fed through on the left side of the cabin here. And let's go ahead and open up the bottom cabinet. We're going to see the dry box that houses our onyx material. So we'll take a look inside there. And so the Mark Forge materials are mainly nylon based, meaning that they are also readily absorbed moisture. So they're hygroscopic. So we got a dry box here. We got some desiccant packs. That's going to protect the material and ensure that we get great part quality every time. Yeah, that's a that's a key feature. I mean, these these machines are so reliable. I mean, there's hardly ever anything that goes wrong with them. So material is is key to that and keeping that clean and yeah. and going through. So, great overview on these. Let's talk a little bit about parts and applications now. Sure. Yeah. So, when we think about uh, low hanging fruit for a Mark Forge printer, one of the first areas that we look at is manufacturing aids. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about jigs and fixtures, we're talking about soft jaws, end of arm tooling. Yeah. So, for instance, here we have an example of some end of arm tooling. These are the types of parts that you would typically machine out of aluminum, and now we can replace them with a Mark Forge printer. Yeah. So we got an example soft jaws there. A lot of these types of parts, you need a machine. It's going to take that machine time, and it's going to be oftentimes more expensive when we're looking at uh, the bottom line of cost. Yeah. Uh, CMM fixture, and we also have a, um, so let's say you're, you're working with a part that you manufacture separately, and you need to fixture it for your CMM process. So again, these are the parts that you typically machine. Uh, then coming over to the other side of the table, we have a few other materials that are more suited to certain applications. Uh, for instance, Onyx ESD is great for those electronics applications to protect them. So here we have a, an electronics enclosure out of Onyx ESD. It has that electrostatic dissipative property. Uh, and again, it's the strongest plastic material. I have a few other enclosure examples here. So this would be a, a mini PC enclosure. Uh, those that design products love these systems. Uh, for prototyping, that's the other area that we see a, a lot of traction in. Yeah, exactly. You can just like, you know, whip out a thought that's in your mind and have it the next day. So. Yeah, exactly. So that's powerful and it, it saves yeah. a lot of time. Uh, another material, Onyx FR, we're thinking about those aerospace applications, mm -hmm. in-cabin parts. That could be as simple as something like a panel inside the aircraft. It could be a gauge cluster or even a, like a cup holder like we have here. Something as simple as that has the VO rating. It's certified for flame, smoke, and toxicity. And so these parts are actually going in aircraft now. And so that opens the door to a, a few more applications. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the sky is really in your imagination of what you can produce. So 
the software that comes with these printers is Iger software. Um, it's a, it comes free with it. There's also a subscription, but if there's an offline version that's available, if you have high security clearance or, or parts that you you know can't distribute out to anyone else, you want to give us a run through of the Iger and how that works and you know kind of what it does to the to the print. Yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and open it up. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here. And so first off, the thing that we notice is this is the Iger dashboard. Right? And so I'm on the cloud-based version here. And Iger has a folder structure. So I could create folders based on customer, uh, user, project. And it works with the whole line of printers. So uh, the Mark II, X7, even the metal system. So I have a few examples on the screen here. Now let's say we wanted to start a print. The software will, will allow you to drag and drop. So we're going to drag and drop an STL file. That's what's accepted by the Iger software. And the first thing that you're going to notice is that we see the build platform. We're working with the Mark II, so let's change that over to the X7. And your first step is to orient it for print. And so we'll just select a surface here. You can select any, any surface on the part, or you can manually rotate your parts. Uh, and then we can also toggle that blacksmith feature that we talked about earlier, that subscription-based in-process laser inspection. And when we come into some of the settings, we can fine-tune our print. And the default on a Mark Forge part is usually the best. Whatever Iger gives you, it's, it's going to most likely be what you go with because it's just so dialed in. But you can change it to different layer heights, so X750 to 250 microns. And some certain layer heights are designated by the diameter of the fiber itself. So all the fibers except for carbon fiber are ran at 100 microns. And carbon fiber has a slightly larger diameter, and, and so we run it at 125 microns. Going on to supports, we could change the angle of that accordion-like structure that we saw from before. And we have features that allow us to speed up the print. So we could do turbo infill or turbo supports for those longer prints, those larger, longer prints. And then on the infill structure itself, we can change the densities. We could change the number of roof, floor, and wall layers. And there's certain cases where, let's say you're going to machine the part afterwards. You can add more thickness to the walls and roofs and floors. And that allows you to remove it later on to get it dialed in just like you'd, you'd like it. And there's a few different infill patterns. So we have triangular, which is what most parts are ran at that we run. And it has a great strength to weight ratio. But there's also a hexagonal, rectangular, and then solid. Sometimes we'll run solid for those smaller components just to make them as rigid as possible. And so there are certain situations where we would choose solid over triangular. And then let's go ahead and slice this out. And we're going to add carbon fiber. And so let's go ahead and slice that. And so what it's going to do now is create a file, uh, essentially G code called an MFP file. And that's going to tell us the print time of the part. It's going to tell us the total mass, the total amount of volume. And it's going to give us that material cost, which is very important for us to understand uh, both internally and, and it also helps for those that are charging their customers for these types of parts. So you, you know right off the machine uh, what we're looking at. And so there we go, just sliced up. And so we have our total print time, 12 hours, $41 in material cost, and you, you know it would be a lot more expensive to machine this piece. And so the next part we want to show you is the internal view. And that's where it gets really exciting in regard to editing and customizing the fiber layout configurations, that CFR that we're talking about. The default on a Mark Forge part throws a, a few layers at the, the beginning of the part, the bottom, and a few layers at the top. And that's the blue that we see here. And let's go ahead and dive into a 2D view so we can look at these fibers a little better. So there's our support structure, that accordion-like shape on an overhang. And as we work our way up, we have the first layer of carbon fiber, that blue area. We have two concentric fiber rings. It even shows you that the, the thickness of the walls, with, in this case, would be about 0.8 millimeters, two extrusions of material. We have those internal holes that are reinforced. And then we have that isotropic fiber that has a direction to it. And as we move up, the default will automatically change the angle of those isotropic fibers. And so that's giving us multi-directional strength automatically. And there are certain cases where I will just make all the fibers one direction. Let's say I know it's a tensile load. If you really have your loading conditions dialed in, uh, that's certainly a great strategy to apply. Let's say I wanted to add a few more fiber layers to the part. We can do that by selecting a group and simply toggling the fiber button. 
Um, we'll go ahead and stick with isotropic fiber, but in this case, I want to add a few more rings to the outside of the part to see if we can help those teeth, strengthen those teeth a little bit. So I'll go ahead and create that group. And so it's going to rehash it out. And now we have that additional group that we just added in there. And so there we go. We have about five rings now. And so those teeth have more fiber. It's going to help us against those loads that we'd expect on a spur gear. And it also helps our holes, so we can reinforce these holes for against side loading conditions as well. And at this stage, it will also allow us to pause the print. So we talked about dropping in that external hardware. I could pause after a certain layer, and when it gets there, it, the machine will automatically stop, and it will send you a notification and, and let you know it's time to drop in that hardware. And we could even scan it after a layer, an individual layer, and compare that to the STL CAD data that we use. And so when we're happy with it, we'll go ahead and save it out. And the next step will be to go to the build platform area. And so we're going to hit print. And we have the X7 build platform. You can scale out there just to see what it looks like on the machine. And at this stage, we could add more parts. So let's say we want to add a few more parts from our library. As long as we're printing with the same material, we could continue to add those parts. And so. I'll go ahead and add about 10 parts here. And it's going to automatically nest those parts for me. And so they're all nested, and we could print it just like we see it here. And, and it adds up the complete print time, and it also will add up the material cost for us. And then when we're ready, we'll select our printers. So we can actually send these jobs remotely anywhere. So I have machines in, in different parts of the US. We have them in Canada. And let's say I wanted uh, my colleague to run a file for me. I could send it, and it'll as long as the printer's clear, it'll start printing that part for him. Uh, or we could even download it and export it to a flash drive and, and drop it off to the printer itself and print that way. So you have a little bit of flexibility. The now switching gears a little bit, we want to also show you Blacksmith, and so that's also done in the Iger software. So we'll we'll take a look at that here. So. Here's a few example builds that we've ran with Blacksmith. And again, that's that in-process laser inspection that we talked about before. And here's a, a test piece that we have ran with the software. Uh, notice right off the bat, we have a point cloud that's been generated. So these are individual scan points that have been built up as the part's been printed. And so we could scan areas with Blacksmith that you couldn't get to with the traditional 3D scanner. So these, like maybe internal features, uh, those hard to reach areas because it's doing it as the parts being built up. Right now we have a tolerance of plus or minus 250 microns uh, on our scale at the bottom. And we could change that tolerance and, and see how many parts are in spec, out of spec. And we could even do further inspection on individual surfaces for perpendicularity, concentric, how concentric are the holes. And we can then download that scan report, which is very nice. Let's say you need to go back to the history of how this part was made. You need to prove it both internally and externally to your customers. This is how you prove that your part was accurate. And it's all automated. So it prints the part. It'll have that scan report that's generated to you. And so this is a really neat feature. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the, the software, the Iger, is already impressive enough. But then you have the blacksmith on there, and you're producing some good quality parts um, out there. So. Uh, thanks for all that information. Uh, I'm sure you know we we work with people all the time that have questions on it. It's it's really simple to use, but you have a kind of a learning curve to it. So that's why we're here. Um, Kanan's always uh, always available to answer some questions on uh, on Iger. So moving on, uh, we've got some exciting news with the FX20. I'm sure you've heard about the FX20. It was just announced by Mark Forge. It's uh, you know, a very impressive printer. And I think we have a video that we're gonna play here and then uh, come back and talk about it a little bit.
that's pretty impressive. I, I'm yeah. excited to get one of those in, uh, in one of our labs and just uh, look at it. So what do you know about it so far? Yeah, yeah, we were very excited about this machine. One of the key things that it has the capability to do is print with high temperature thermoplastics like Ultim 9085 filament. And if you're not familiar with that filament, it's heavily used in aerospace, heavily used in automotive. And the printer is also going to be bigger. It's going to be faster and more sophisticated than anything else that MarkForge has ever produced. I think we have a, a sheet up here. So let's take a look at the specs. When we go to build volume, it's quite a bit larger. We're looking at single nozzle builds being 525 by 400 by 400 millimeters. You have multi-nozzle builds at 500 by 400 by 400. The machine size is about the size of a commercial fridge, so quite a bit larger than the X7. The layer thicknesses are from 50 to 250, like we saw on the X7, although it's going to be printing more accurately, and it's going to be printing faster. And so let's compare 250 to 250. The FX20 is twice as fast as the X7. And so yeah. we're printing faster, and that's great for that larger build volume, those bigger parts that we see. On the power requirements, it's 243 phase, so it's a little bit more power hungry than we saw with the X7. And, and it can handle those high temp thermoplastics up to 200 degrees Celsius. It still will operate off of Iger. And when we look at plastics available, it has all the plastics in the Mark Forge portfolio with the addition of this Ultim 9085 filament. And again, this is a big deal because this material is very resistant to harsh environments. It's very strong by itself. And it has an incredibly high heat deflection temperature. And so the key is now we could add carbon fi fiber to that Ultim, and we're getting yeah. these very strong parts when we're bringing that metal-like strength to the harshest environments. And then it also has an Ultim support material, and so that, that's also one of the plastics that will be available. And on fibers available, we have all the same fibers that we saw on the X7, although some of the fibers are more tuned for Ultim, and so that's going to be the difference that we see there. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you, you mentioned on something, you, you said multi-nozzle. What's the difference between a single nozzle, you know, dual nozzle or multi-nozzle? Yeah, so the print head on the FX20 actually has three nozzles. So you have one nozzle for your plastic, one nozzle for your fiber. That's just what we saw on the X7 and the Mark II. But that third nozzle is actually dedicated to your support material. And so um, we can switch between each nozzle depending on the part, that individual part, and you often will use all three, especially if you're printing CFR with Ultim. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that's really noticeable from the graph up there and then what we looked at with the X7 and the Mark II is the materials in these two are up top where it's below on the FX20. What's the reasoning for that? Yeah, so the, the material cabinet on the FX20 is way more sophisticated than we have on the X7. It has the ability to have humidity control, temperature control, and it can store up to four materials. It actually has the ability to also actively load separate spools. So let's say we're running with Ultim, we could have two Ultim spools loaded up, and when the first one runs out, the second one will pick it up and you'll continue to print. And so that's excellent for those really long prints. And then it also has an area for a third plastic. So let's say you have Onyx that you also want to store in there. And then the last slot's going to be for that Ultim support material. Yeah, yeah. What about removing the, the Ultim uh, uh, filament supports in there? Yeah, so that process is going to be very similar to what we saw on the X7 and the Mark II. Yeah. So that Ultim support material will be breakaway. Uh, you can break it off by hand or with the use of pliers, just like we did with the Onyx. And it's also able to be processed at room temperature. And so that's different than we see with other manufacturers that work with Ultim materials. And so the Ultim 9085 filament with its support here, again, it's remove it just at room temperature, and that's gonna save you a lot of time if you look out there. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're super excited about it. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get some. I, I think they're gonna be out, what, Q2 next year? Yep, yep Q2. And uh, be, you know, first year production, so it, it's going to be a little bit lower, but if you have uh, any interest in these, I, I suggest that you contact us. We're taking pre-orders for them now, um, or at least you know prove it out to see if this is the system that you need, or if you want to look at a different system. So, um, but I'm excited about oh, it. Oh yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for the information today. Um, it was great. We covered a lot of stuff on there. One of the things that we want to look at now is, uh, you know, at Hawkridge Systems, we do sales, service, and support. And 
one of the things that's overlooked a lot of times, I think, is, uh, is financing. So we work with a lot of financing companies, um, have a lot of experience in that. So um, towards the end of the year, a lot of people have money left over in their budgets. Other people don't have any money left over in their budgets, but they need a printer and have a need to produce parts. Um, so we work with a lot of companies that, uh, that can change your capital expenditure the way that most companies look at purchasing capital equipment. Um, whether it's the, you know, the, the smallest of the Mark Forge printers or going all the way up to the FX20. Uh, one of the things that we can work with those financing companies and with you on is turning that capital expenditure into an operational expenditure. And one of the, the key features of that is it, it also changes the category, but it also works differently on your taxes at the end of the year. So um, at the end of that term, that equipment is still yours. Usually there's like a dollar buyout, but it's spread out over time. So you don't have to come up with that cash up front. Uh, we also work with uh, a, a lot of companies who uh, say maintenance or engineering departments who have a cap on their, um, their company credit card and they can purchase up to, I've seen some up to like $10,000 a month where we've worked at splitting those payments up with those customers so they're able to get those uh, the equipment that they need right away, and they can start printing with it, producing parts and working with it. Uh, so those are some of the things that we can work with you and explore if you're interested in it. Mark Forge also has a lot of uh, promotions going on, end of year promotions, a lot of great deals. So if you're interested in some of these printers, I definitely uh, say contact us as soon as possible and we can get something going for you. So I'm gonna take a uh, look at the chat, see if we've got anything in the chat. Hopefully we've got some questions here. Um, Yes, one of the questions is, uh, can I start a print from remote? Yeah, yeah. so on, um, it, on the Mark II and the X7, you could send it from anywhere. So as long as the build platform is clear, uh, you just send it directly from the Iger software and it'll get started. And that's been very handy, especially during COVID when we can't go to the office as much. Yep. We just send it straight to the machine. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of categories out there where companies are working together. Uh, Mark Forge worked with uh, Automation Alley out in, uh, in the Detroit area, and that's exactly what it was, is that you could go in and, and you could print off of any one of those machines should the need arise. So we, we can print remotely from anywhere. This is one of our labs that we have. Uh, we have like nine digital labs, just like this digital manufacturing lab. So he can go on and print from any one of those. So that's a, that's a great feature. Um, how do the parts stick to the bed? Are they hard to get on? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So um, to place a part before a print, you use a glue stick. And so you put a thin layer of glue anywhere you have your part geometry. And that does two things. It'll help with those early layers to help those adhere to the bed, bed platform. But also afterwards, it actually helps you, oddly enough, to remove parts using the scraper at the end. So just, yeah, it gets yeah. that little rigidity and just kind of pops off yep, there. Pops so off. it just comes off really nice and clean. Yep. Uh, pricing on the machines. We, um, you know, they're, they're all the way from the lower end. Um, I think the basic Mark Forge starts out at about uh, $5,000 and you get up into the X7. That's right around $70,000. Um, there's other plans that you can add on. There are success plans. Uh, to cover your equipment, but that's the general scope of where we're at on there. Um, do you think shrink ratios are different for the different materials? So Mark Forge has it dialed in, and the answer yes, so different materials, but these are mainly nylon based, and so that allows you to stay consistent with your ratios, especially the onyxes, the, the white, white nylon, for instance. Those have a very similar shrink rate that's repeatable, and it's also automatically adjusted for in the Iger software. Oh, yeah, that's great. Uh, yep, I think we just covered that. So I'm not seeing anything else on here right now. So we're gonna hang out after this and uh, you know, we'll be available for about 10, 15 minutes, answer any of the other questions that come through. Uh, but definitely we will, uh, if you have any questions on the printers, materials, support services, any of the other products that Hawkridge covers, um, please reach out to us. Uh, we, we're here to help you. As I said, we're a solutions provider. We don't just uh, you know, ship printers or ship products. So uh, we're here to help you out, guide you along and make you successful in what you're, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. So thank you very much for joining in today. Thank you, Kanan, for all the information. And uh, we'll see you later.